This is an RNZ podcast. Kia ora and welcome to Elemental, a podcast from RNZ. In this chemistry podcast for non-chemists like me, we are celebrating 150 years of the periodic table. I'm Alison Balance, or perhaps I should use my chemical name, Alan. As you told me in the last episode, I can spell out my name using symbols from the periodic table. So remembering that I spell Alison with one L and Balance with two Ls, that gives me aluminium, A-L, iodine, I, sulphur, S, oxygen, O and nitrogen, N. Together they spell Alison. Mm-hmm. And balance, boron, aluminium, lanthanum, mm, nitrogen, cerium. <laughs> And that gives us balance. And I'm Alan Blackman. I'm chemistry professor at the Auckland University of Technology. And I can spell my first name in chemical elements. Sadly, I can't spell my second name because the M kind of mucks things up, which is a bit of a shame. But while we're talking about spelling, the element that we're going to talk about today, we've got a spelling-related point. And that element we're going to talk about is cesium. And you will see cesium written in two ways, or two different spellings, C-A-E-S-I-U-M or C-E-S-I-U-M. And the former is the sort of internationally accepted way of spelling it, let's say. The latter is probably the American way of spelling it, so we're going to follow the British English spelling. And that makes that all important for this episode 15 of Elemental, we're up to cesium rather than calcium, which we would be were we using the American spelling. No, we're definitely sticking with cesium with an A. What's our <laughs> catchphrase for this episode going to be? What makes cesium interesting, Alan? Well, it's a bit of a timekeeper. It both acts as the basis for our scale of time and it can tell us how much time has elapsed since particular events. So times and dates. Indeed, yes. Excellent. So chemically, what is it? What are its vital statistics? Okay, vital statistics. Cesium, its name comes from the Latin cesius for sky blue, because when you put cesium salts in a flame, they go a beautiful blue colour. Discovered in 1860, element number 55 on the periodic table. That puts it in group one on the left of the periodic table and around about halfway down. Just so you know where we're talking about, group one has got hydrogen at the top and all those other lithium and potassium and sodium and those sorts of metals. It is what we call, or what we used to call, an alkali metal. That's sort of the old name for uh, these sorts of things. And it is extraordinarily reactive with water. If you take some cesium and put it into water, yeah, search YouTube, you'll find some examples of this. Those of you who know your sodiums and lithiums and potassiums, what happens when you put them in water, you can probably figure out that this is going to be uh, quite impressive. I seem to remember from chemistry classes back at school, back in the day when (laughs) chemistry teachers were allowed to do these things, taking various of these things outside and dropping them in puddles. Yes. I don't think you do that anymore. Oh, well, if you don't (laughs) tell anybody, you can. But yeah, I mean, the kids always like that sort of stuff. But no, no, you wouldn't play around with cesium and you wouldn't put it anywhere near water. And in fact... It's also pyrophoric, which is a good word. Well, that's a lovely word, pyrophoric. Meaning that it can ignite spontaneously in air. So there are some elements that do that. This is most certainly one of them, which means that you've got to keep it away from air and you've got to keep it away from water. So generally you can sort of store it under oil or you can sort of store it in hermetically sealed containers or ones that are full of nitrogen, etc., etc. And but don't accidentally a... take the lid off. No, no, <laughs> indeed not. Be very, very careful with it. And the other interesting thing about cesium, or one of the other interesting things about cesium, of course, it's almost the third liquid element on the periodic table. It has a melting point of 28.4 degrees Celsius. It's nearly liquid at room temperature. That's kind of just a warm room temperature, and I'm thinking of the summer that we've just had in New Zealand. In lots of places, for a lot of the time, it would have been liquid. Absolutely. That's curious to consider. And <laughs> yeah, so in Antarctica, it's never going to be liquid, whereas in the tropics, where it's warm all the time, it's going to be liquid heaps of the time. Indeed, and keep it out of the rain, I guess, in the tropics would be wise advice. <laughs> and while we are on the topic of geography, which you've very nicely provided me a segue, two, we're going to talk briefly about a particular cesium isotope, cesium-137, 
which is a radioactive isotope of cesium, and it is formed as a result of nuclear fission. So in other words, we're talking atomic bombs, we're talking nuclear power stations, those sorts of things. And obviously in the days before the first atomic bomb, which was 1945, there was none of this particular cesium isotope in the air at all, cesium-137. And then all of a sudden we start seeing it, Cold War, all of those airborne nuclear tests, so we get lots of cesium-137 in the air. We have Chernobyl, we have Fukushima. Again, they all add to the amount of this particular isotope in the air. And what we saw with particularly the latter two examples was that the isotope could travel long distances in the air and then it comes back to the ground and it gets incorporated into the soil and water and then unfortunately gets into the food chain. So therefore... The presence or absence of cesium-137 in a particular sample can tell you something about uh, the date that that sample was prepared. So like carbon dating, we can use cesium actually for dating as well. And this has led to a really rather interesting dating method for wine. I don't know if you knew, Alison, but apparently counterfeit wine is big business. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> like, like apparently very big business, especially the very, very old bottles of wine, obviously. And so... What is needed to make sure that these very, very old bottles of wine are as old as they are claimed is some non-invasive technique by which the contents can be aged. And the way to do that is using cesium-137. We simply look for the telltale presence of cesium-137 in the wine, and if it's there and the bottle purports to come from previous to 1945, then obviously it's a fake. And I think that's really rather clever. So there you go. Atomic bomb tests <laughs> and um, dating wine. You never thought you'd link those. No, so you can tell whether the wine is really a fine old wine or whether it's a nuclear vintage. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. And in fact, they've gone and tested some California wines as well. And they have seen the spike in the cesium content of those from the Fukushima nuclear disaster. So that's kind of interesting. And again, that will be useful, I guess, in years to come to date those particular wines. So it's pretty ubiquitous in our environment, but it's present in just really tiny quantities, isn't it? So it's not a problem. Yeah, indeed. So, you know, that's a good thing. However, of course, if you do have lots of it, then the fact that it's radioactive means it's not going to be great for you. And there's a particularly tragic story from Brazil in 1987 where there were some scavengers going around an old scrap metal dealer. Now, unfortunately, that particular dealer happened to have a radiation capsule. That was an old piece of medical equipment. It was used for radiotherapy, but then it was sort of thrown out. And it contained this beautiful blue glowing powder. And so a bunch of kids got into that and they thought, wow, this looks pretty cool. So they took it home and they started playing with the powder. And sadly, they didn't realize that it contained cesium-137. And that got to around about 250 people. One child died, which is obviously one child too many, so it could have been much worse, I guess, but still a bit tragic. Now, the theme of this episode of Elemental, you'd mentioned time and dates. You've mentioned the dating bit of it. Are there any more time connections? Well, most definitely there are, and a very, very important one as well. There are seven fundamental units in what we call the SI system of units, of which the unit of time is one, and the unit of time, as we all know, is the second And so the definition of the second since 1967, do you want to hear the whole thing? Sure. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, the second is 9,192,631,770 periods of the wavelength of light associated with the transition between two hyperfine energy levels of the ground state of the cesium-133 atom. Why, thank you. (laughs) And what on earth does that mean? (laughs) And and importantly, the cesium-133 atom has to be at a temperature of absolute zero and at rest. Oh, of course. That's important. Okay, now can you put that in plain English, please? (laughs) Okay, so the electrons in cesium occupy particular energy levels. And the speed at which these electrons can sort of jump between a couple of these energy levels forms the basis of our definition of the second. So it is kind of cool. Crikey. So the cesium <laughs> is our definition of a second. That's incredible. Normally yeah. in this uh, sound suite as I'm recording this, there would be a clock ticking down the seconds. Tick, tick, <laughs> tick. But I do have to report it's stuck at the moment. <laughs> So not only is cesium important in the definition of the second, there are other units which rely on the definition of the second as well. So they are also, I guess, indirectly related to the definition of the second. But that's all changing this year because uh, the people who decide such things in their infinite wisdom have decided to redefine some of these particular 
units. Not the second, though. That's still staying as is. So what else is going to change then? What has the second defined up until now? So we've got the volt and um, also got the meter. So they are related to the definition of the second. So, yeah, that's kind of important. So cesium really is the ultimate timekeeper for us and has been, Mm -hmm. (laughs) even though it's about to be dethroned, the ultimate measurer. (laughs) Indeed. One more interesting fact about cesium is that, apart from gold and copper, it's the only other metal that doesn't look a nice silvery or grey colour. And, in fact, pure cesium is very, very slightly golden. And my friend Peter Schwertfeger at Massey University could explain all of that in terms of relativity and stuff like that, but we're not going to go there. No, but never mind. One day, Peter. (laughs) On that note, this is Elemental. It's a podcast from RNZ. You'll find Cesium, this episode, and all of the previous episodes online at rnz.co.nz. Or subscribe to us for free as a podcast. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all your favourite places, really. And if you're enjoying the podcast, we'll take all the aroha you can give us. Rate, review, share, awesome. Thanks. I'm Alison Balance. And I'm Alan Blackman, and we're back next time with calcium. But for now, cheerio from us. See ya. 